Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to today's presentation by Ria and Sarah on why climate change is the biggest global issue of our time. Before we begin, Dr. Clements would like to say a few words regarding the Oxford grant. All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome here on behalf of especially the Faculty of Natural and Applied Sciences. I'm the Assistant Dean, and I'm really looking forward to tonight. As well as being Assistant Dean, I'm Director of the grant that we won um, in 2021, and it was uh, for $230,000. So a small fraction of it is supporting tonight's event. And this grant was awarded, as was mentioned, by um, the Science and Christianity in Oxford. And it's a three-year grant. In our proposal, we wrote, our project will address TW's mission to produce godly Christian leaders by focusing on faithful approaches to and the connections between environmental stewardship and human flourishing. So tonight, in this event supported by that grant, we're going to hear from Sarah Damien and Rhea Clark as they join leaders from around the world in the pursuit of better stewardship of a planet now that's rocked by extremes of climate change. Um, it's a really neat opportunity they had, and it's a, a really special uh, group they applied to be part of. And another cool thing is that this is the second year in a row that we've had representatives from Trinity Western go there. Well, last year we had one. And Kat Jenkins, sitting over there, went last year when it was in Scotland. And this year it was more of a tropical tour. Um, and ever since the summer, we've been planning to have them share with you. So I'm really looking forward to hearing from them. And I'm going to turn this back over to our MC. Um, by the way, uh, it's so great to uh, have such a great crowd here tonight, and enjoy. And now, Dr. Sikma, the di Executive Director of the Canadian Scientific and Christian Affiliation, has a few words to say. Sure, thanks. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Arnold Sikma. I'm the physics professor here at Trinity Western University, as well as uh, Executive Director of the Canadian Scientific and Christian Affiliation and also the leader of the Vancouver chapter of that, which uh, and so we're happy to co-sponsor tonight's event. I should say a few things about the CSCA. Uh, so you can find everything out um, from our website, csca.ca. Uh, and there's some pamphlets on the back table representing a number of different topical areas that people have been working on. Um, I'll also mention that the CSCA is a network of, of Christians in the sciences all across Canada. We're affiliated with the American Scientific Affiliation uh, as well as the Christians in Science in the UK and a group uh, in, in Australia as well. So it's just really valuable for Christians who are working in the sciences to network together for fellowship and professional development and, and sharing knowledge and ideas and perspectives. And I've been a part of the association for um, about 26 years now. So and I've been the executive director since 2018. Um, I would like to encourage you to look at some future events that we have lined up as well. So on Friday the 28th, actually the Friday the 27th, a lot of you are students and so that's great. So you'll be here for this particular event. On the 27th, we have uh, Dr. Robert Mann, who is a, a physics professor at the University of Waterloo. And he's with the Perimeter Institute in Waterloo as well. So he was uh, a president of, he's the only person who has been the president of the Canadian Association of Physicists, and also the Canadian Scientific and Christian Affiliation. And he was actually my undergraduate mentor and advisor and co-author on my first scientific papers. And so he'll be speaking on, for, for the Lunch and Learn series that some of you in the sciences know about, it's on Friday the 27th at 1230, and he's talking about this, carving out a career path for a Christian in the sciences. So that would be really valuable for you to attend. The next day is a really big day for us at CSCA. So this is our 50th anniversary. Uh, we started, we're formed in 1973. And so we have a series of past presidents lectures happening across the country uh, from the East Coast to the, from the West Coast to the East Coast. Uh, and we are having the first one by Dr. Robert Mann on that Saturday at one o'clock here. And his talk is called To Infinity and Beyond, 50 Years of Exploring Science and Faith. 
And we're wrapping that up with a couple of other events. So at 10 o'clock in here is a watch party for the American Scientific Affiliation Winter Symposium, which is a, an event of its own uh, merit that's really quite amazing. Uh, we have, uh, the event is called Scientists and the Church. And it's an international webinar presented by the American Scientific Affiliation and the CSEA. And the main speaker is Walter Kim, who's the president of the National Association of Evangelicals, a U.S. organization um, encompassing many different uh, Christians across the, the country and the states. And responded to by uh, Jessica Merman, who's the vice president of science and policy environmental education, or sorry, and evangelical environmental network. So that's uh, Saturday at 10 o'clock, Saturday the 28th at 10 o'clock in this room. We'll be having a watch party. You can watch it from wherever you are, but why not watch it with a bunch of friends over here? And then you could have a breakfast. You could, before that, you could have breakfast. And after that, you could have lunch. And there will be signups for that. Um, so if you go to csca.ca slash Vancouver or even csca.ca slash TWU, you can find out information all about that. Um, and finally, on, on that same day, actually, he'll be, he'll be speaking at the University of British Columbia as well that evening on a topic called uh, Time and Eternity. I think that's what it's called, Time and Eternity, over at uh, the only Canadian uh, member of the uh, Consortium for Christian Study Centers which is a North American group of, of, of such organizations around public universities. Um, and finally, I want to promote the conference. And so in July, we have a, an international conference at the University of Toronto, Mississauga. A number of people who are here were at the not last international conference, which was in San Diego, and um, including Carissa, uh, and maybe others who are here as well. Um, uh, so if you're a, you're all, a lot of you are science students, and if you're doing research at all, and if you'd like to present your research to a friendly audience of fellow Christians, uh, this is a great opportunity to do that. Even if you don't, haven't thought deeply about a Christian perspective on your particular topic, just to give a research presentation as a poster at that conference would be wonderful. And the call for abstracts is on the, on the website. If you go to csca.ca slash 2023, and you'll get to the website for the conference and submit an abstract. The abstract deadline is listed as January 15, which is coming up very soon, but I'm under, uh, I'm under, good, uh, under good authority, I can tell you that that, that deadline will be extended. <laughs> so usually this happens, and probably if you wait until another week, you'll still be able to get your abstract in. So please go ahead and, and think about going there. Students can, who get, get their abstract accepted, get lodging and registration fees uh, significantly rebated uh, through generous donations. So... Those are a few words about the CSEA. Feel free to talk to me afterwards about this event, um, about the CSEA after the event, and um, check us out on csea.ca. And we're really happy to be um, co-sponsoring this event. And thanks for the opportunity to say a few words. And back to Santiago. Thank you, Dr. Sikama. Okay, uh, and now I'll turn it over to Sarah and Ria as they present why climate change is the biggest global issue of our time. Hi everyone, I'm Ria, and I just want to take out the time and just say how much we appreciate each of you individually taking out your time today and coming here to educate yourselves on such an important issue. And um, we also want to let you guys know that the cups are compostable, so don't throw them in the garbage or anything like that. There's a compost bin right over there, right in front, if you look through those doors. So, yeah. So first, I'm just going to kind of share to you guys my journey of how I got to COP27. I'm a third year biology major with a psychology minor. I'm a Derby Reach Park ambassador. I'm also, I was also a climate ambassador at the Langley Environmental Partner Society last summer. And I'm the vice president and media manager at the Trinity Western Environmental Club. And of course, I was a COP27 observer. So my environmental journey kind of started the several times I visited India and just kind of witnessing the amount of pollution that I saw everywhere, that, that kind of brought me into um, the idea of, wow, this is something that I'm really passionate about. And then my first year at Trinity, I decided to join the environmental club with Sarah. And um, through many other opportunities and through um, Dr. Clemens encouraging us to sign up for COP27, I signed up and by God's graces, I was accepted and I got to go on this fantastic journey. And now I'm gonna hand it over to Sarah and she can share. Hi, I'm Sarah. I'm also a third year biology student and a psychology minor. 
So where I am most putting in my time for climate action is with my research with Dr. Clements. We're studying invasive plant growth knotweed along Chilliwack River. And this is as a result of the 2021 flood that happened in Chilliwack. And so I'm a treasurer of the Trinity Western Environmental Club, and um, I'm just so happy to share our experience today. All right, so you guys are probably wondering what even is COP27? And just to kind of start this off, maybe you guys are wondering, isn't it kind of counterproductive that all of these people are flying to Egypt and with the air pollution? Very true. But also you have to come to realize that these meetings, these negotiations, this education cannot take place just over Zoom. We need everyone in one location. And through that, there is that adverse effect. But this is so important just to get the talk of cl climate change going. And yeah, so now we're going to go into what COP27 is. So COP27 is an abbreviation that stands for Conference of the Parties. And 27 represents this being the 27th year that this is hosted. Next year is COP28, and that will be hosted in Dubai. So COP27 is where representatives from, I think, around 190 countries, they meet and political leaders and climate activists, they come and they share and they discuss climate-related issues. So kind of the main pillars of COP27 is one, it educates thousands of people around the world about climate change, but also mitigation. So this kind of includes how are countries um, reducing their emissions and adaptation? How are these countries working through adapting to climate change and how are they helping other countries work through these problems? And third, arguably the most important is climate finance. And this is how much money do we have funding um, climate change and combating this global issue? Um, so what's really cool, too, is that the COP27 center is divided into two sections, the blue zone and the green zone. So Sarah and I, we had the privilege to be able to go to the blue zone. To go to the blue zone, you need um, UN UNFCC credentials. You need a badge. Not anyone can enter this zone. Um, this is where um, there's a lot of political leaders and really cool people. And each country has a pavilion where they kind of display what they're doing regarding climate change. And this is also a location where people can share their innovative ideas of combating climate change. Then there's the green zone. The green zone is open to all public, the whole Egyptian public. And this is where um, the Egyptian government displays what they're doing regarding climate change. And a lot of students who um, learn in Egypt kind of display their projects, their artwork, and I would say it's more of a creative aspect of the conference center. Okay, what is CCOP? So CCOP is Christian Climate Observers Program. This is the group that we were selected to go with to go to Egypt this year. What's very amazing about CCOP is they let people from all around the world enter their program. So it's not limited to Canada. And actually, we were two of the four people in Canada who were accepted. So that was a great honor. The goal of CCOP is to train the next generation of Christian climate leaders. And um, this group right here was our week one group that we spend most of our time with. Okay, what is climate change? Let's go through a bit of a vocab crash course. Fossil fuels. So fossil fuels, fuels are carbon-rich animal and plant remains that are buried for a million years that are now burned for energy. Growing population requires more energy. That's obvious, considering we use gas, oil, and coal for um, housing, um, energy within our homes, transportation, and food. Greenhouse gases. Gases in Earth's atmosphere that have the ability to absorb and trap heat. So burning fossil fuels is what releases greenhouse gases. And we're abbreviating greenhouse gases as GHG. Examples include carbon dioxide and methane, and these are two of the biggest contributors. Emissions. Greenhouse gases have been released into the atmosphere, um, which have been caused by activities that are burning fossil fuels and industrial agriculture. And this is what is termed as emissions or greenhouse gas emissions. Photosynthesis. 
Anyone who knows um, any science classes would know this. The process by which plants convert carbon dioxide into oxygen. Okay, renewable energy. This is energy that comes from naturally occurring resources such as sunlight, wind, and water, and these don't produce any greenhouse gases. Global average temperature is the average temperature of Earth, including land use and sea, including land and sea for each year. So also what's really important to understand is that carbon dioxide, it contributes 76% 76, 76 of all emissions, and leading that is methane. But what's really interesting about methane is that it actually absorbs 84 times as much heat as carbon dioxide does. So it's essentially more potent, which is why it's really important that we reduce methane emissions as well. And so this is Earth's surface by type. And here we can see that 71% of Earth's surface is ocean, 3% is glaciers, and 25% is habitable, and 6% is barren. And now this is just kind of like the habitable, habitable part. 42% is grassland, so used for livestock, cattle, etc. 1% is freshwater, and 57% is forest. But if we look into 2018 with the growing population and human infrastructure and the need for food, now we have 31% of the habitable land being for grazing, 14% is grassland, and now 38% is forest, 15% crops, and 1% urban, and 1% freshwater. So I wanted to kind of display to you guys something really cool. I've talked to a few people about their perspectives about climate change, and some people say, who cares about climate change? This is just Earth's normal process. Um, CO emissions are in the atmosphere. Trees, plants, they will regulate it, and that's that. Which is true to a certain degree. So imagine that these plants represent Earth 100% covered in nature. So this is prior to the introduction of human infrastructure, so no house is nothing. This is just totally plants. And here, let's say um, animals and plants, when they die and they decompose, they will emit CO2 into the atmosphere. So this is going to represent CO2 in the atmosphere. So, you know, it's in the atmosphere and now it can be regulated. The trees will absorb the CO2 and there will be chemical exchanges and the output will be oxygen, which is great. And that works, that cycles, the dynamic equilibrium works, except with rising human populations, now we're cutting down, let's say 33% of the trees of nature. And now we're introducing buildings, houses, we're introducing cars, we're introducing cattle um, and livestock to support the growing human population. Now there is 33% extra CO2 in the atmosphere that isn't cycled through. So there is an overproduction production of CO2, which is absorbing, absorbing so much more heat than the plants can process. So looking at this, this myth and what people, some people view isn't true. There is a serious issue. And if there weren't um, infrastructure and forests weren't getting cut down and we were perfectly from the very start with 100% nature, then it would work out. But looking at how um, buildings are rapidly growing, um, there's just even more CO2 in the atmosphere than we can handle. And another um, kind of myth that I've heard people talk about is this is just a natural cycle of Earth. Sometimes Earth can be extremely hot and sometimes Earth can be extremely cold. But looking at this data brought to you by NASA, um, we can see from the 18, 1800s to 2020 that Right now, we are in an extremely, extremely hot zone, in the maroon zone. And this, it has never been this hot before. And when people talk about, oh yeah, Earth gets hot and cold, and that's true, but it has never gotten this hot before. And this just shows you that that myth also is not true. Okay, so this is a quote from Saving Us, which is a book I read in my physics class by Catherine Hayhoe. It's the planet is warming, humans are responsible, the impacts are serious, and the time to act is now. So fossil fuels have benefited humans since the Middle Ages, main driver of climate change since the, 18, since the 1800s, human activities. So economies rely on fossil fuels for electricity, heating homes, and running vehicles. Unfortunately, this causes long-term shifts in weather patterns and temperatures. 
So climate change is a threat multiplier. It takes global issues such as a lack of access to clean water, poverty, disease, hunger, and um, political crises that lead to refugee crises, and it makes them worse. So those who contribute the least to climate change are unfortunately the same people who are experiencing the majority of their impacts. So most people will think about climate change and they think about, oh, it's about protecting plants and animals, et cetera, et cetera. But you also have to realize that mass migration comes into play here. So um, according to the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, 21.5 million people migrate each year due to natural disasters. And in the next 30 years, another 143 million people are expected to be forced to migrate due to these environmental disasters. What's also really unfortunate is that these climate refugees are not recognized under the refugee status under the 1951 Refugee Committee. So they aren't protected with the same ways that other refugees are protected, which is very unfortunate. 90% um, of refugees are from nations that are on the front lines of the climate emergency. And what also really impacts these refugees from migrating is also when these natural disasters happen, food is impacted so much, whether it's flooding, whether it's droughts. And if the place you live can't support you with food, of course you're going to move. And so crop failure is causing a lot of ma mass migration around the world. So um, here's also a quote that I personally like from Mark Ruffalo, which says, Climate change is the greatest threat to our existence in our short history on this planet. Nobody is going to buy their way out of its effects. Okay, let's talk about sea level rise. This is a common thing that's brought up when someone discusses climate change. So oceans have absorbed more than 90% of the heat from greenhouse gases, and unfortunately, it's taking a major toll. In 2021, a new record was set for ocean heating. So average sea levels have rose about 23 centimeters since 1880. The sea levels rise an additional 3.2 millimeters every year. Sea level rise is accelerating and it's predicted to rise one foot by 2050. What does that mean? Essentially about the same increase in the next 30 years is predicted over what happened for the last century. So the most vulnerable populations in the U.S. live on the East and Gulf Coast, and damaging flooding is predicted to occur 10 times more frequently than it does today. That gives some perspective for the U.S., and you can imagine where it is elsewhere. So how is climate change causing sea levels to rise? There's three main factors. Um, we have thermal expansion. When water heats up, it expands and takes more space. Melting glaciers. Continuous higher temperatures contribute to um, increased summer meltings and diminished snowfalls. As a result, we have an imbalance between ocean evaporation and runoff. And lastly, melting ice sheets. So huge ice sheets that cover um, Greenland and Antarctica are melting quicker. This is an example of that was taken from one family that's experiencing extreme flooding in their community. <coughs> So with the increase of the global average temperature, there comes extreme weather patterns. And we can look all around the world. So first, we're going to take you to the 2022 Pakistani floods. Here, the death toll is 1,739 people, including 647 children. Now, for me and Sarah, it's really important to look at this not as a, stati a statistic. These aren't just some random people who passed away. But these are children of God. These are people who have lives, who deserve to live long, beautiful lives who were taken away because of this disaster caused by climate change. And we as humans are contributing to this. Another 12,867 individuals were injured and half a million people were left homeless. And including this, two million acres of crop was damaged. So this is going back to how there are, there's an increase in climate refugees because there's no food, there's no place to live. So of course they're gonna to have to leave. And this, you can already imagine being refugees, how much of an issue that causes in the world. So floods aren't familiar, unfamiliar to us. This is 2021 Pacific Northwest floods that occurred in Merritt, Abbotsford, Chilliwack. Many of us have homes or families who are there. So 
it's a much smaller scale. We only had five people die, but it was huge for our community because hundreds of thousands of animals died and also thousands of crops were lost and fields were damaged. This was the most expensive climate disaster in BC history, and this is not even counting invasive plant damage or anything that has occurred from it. So my thesis I'm doing um, with Dr. Clemens is studying the specific Northwest floods, and it's just showing that even with, um, even with us in Canada kind of considering ourselves privileged, this will never happen to us. It's happening to us, and this is a reality right now. What's really important to recognize is that we're just, that like right now, we're seeing all of these issues around the world. It's just going to get worse. And that's the reality of it. We're going to see so many more climate related disasters and our future, our children, our grandchildren are going to see that. And now we're going to take you to Venice, Italy. So um, Venice right now is at extremely serious risk of completely being engulfed by the sea. And it's actually theorized by 2100 that Venice, Italy will be completely submerged underwater. Already in 2019, um, I think Italy, or Venice, sorry, faced its greatest flood yet, where 80% of Venice was flooded. And along with this comes the finances. So this has cost Venice 1 billion USD in repairing damages. And it's so important to recognize that Venice is a beautiful, beautiful place with so much architecture and so much history and culture. And seeing a place like this at risk of completely being gone forever is so saddening. And it really is our duty to protect this. Species extinction. So the rate of species extinction is increasing due to human caused climate change and human activities. Extreme weather events are increasing in severity and frequency. So as you can imagine with higher temperatures than the animals can handle, it's directly killing wildlife. Some Australian examples of this are koalas dying from dehydration due to the leaves that they rely on for moisture um, being dried up. In addition to this, flying foxes dying by the thousands from overheating. An extreme example was in 2018 from the heat wave. So in 2019-2020, we faced the Australian um, wildfires. The death toll of this was 479 people and 3 billion animals were either killed or displaced because of these fires, which is just so disheartening. If you really think about it more than just a, a statistic, each animal, each person, that is just so crazy to me. And 60 million to 84 million acres of land was burnt. And there you go, food production, cattle, whatever you can think about. And 9,352 buildings lost. And you can just imagine how much money it costs to repair the damages to support these people who lost homes. This is Fort McMurray uh, wildfires in Alberta. So another example of Canada, this was um, people were evacuated. And I wanted to bring this up because this is introducing our human health aspect to it, where 20% of this community reached out for mental health um, related health after this. And so it's more than um, immediate. There's lasting effects that happen from being exposed to this traumatic event. The African droughts. Um, I think this kind of looking into this and learning about this at COP27 really broke my heart personally. Um, looking at the death toll, you can imagine that it's much higher than what we got online, but 50,000 to 200,000 people the animal toll is 150,000. Um, one in three Africans struggle accessing water, which is just ridiculous one. It is a human necessity. It is a basic need. We all deserve the right to water. And imagine struggling to just drink water. We are so privileged being here in Canada. And what's also really um, sad to me is there are animals like lions and giraffes and zebras beautiful wild animals that i know we all can appreciate they're already endangered but with this climate crisis they're also dying away right here in figure 17 we can see six giraffes who passed away um, from malnutrition due to the lack of water and in figure 18 we can see that the average temperature of africa is at an alt that, that it's just soaring it's going crazy from 1910 to um, 2020, 
So it's just, you can just imagine that it's just going to get worse. And we really need to try our best to slow it down and stop it right now. Let's talk about how this relates to human health. Air pollution. Nine million premature, premature deaths occur annually due to air pollution caused from fossil fuels. In 2019, majority of the world's population was living in zones that did not meet air quality guidelines. And this is just one photo of many. So right here, we're looking at data that was collected in New Delhi, which is the capital of India. So the black dash line is what the World Health Organization says that the air pollution um, quality should be at. And the red is what India says it should be at for New Delhi. But if you look at it, oh man, is New Delhi going crazy? And the main cause of this is dust and construction, which contributes 45% of air pollution. And personally, I have heard stories from my parents of how bad air pollution can affect people who live there. I have family members who have terrible respiratory illnesses, cardiovascular illnesses. I've heard stories of children in school buses on their way to school puking out of the windows. And that is just ridiculous to me. We all deserve to be breathing in clean, fresh air. And the fact that there are places in the world where that isn't even accessible, that is just crazy to me. So right here, we can also look at um, other issues that climate change causes health-wise. So air pollution increases asthma, cardiovascular disease, as I just mentioned. Um, severe weather increases fatalities, injuries. Um, extreme heat causes heat-related illnesses and deaths. And we all saw that in BC when the heat wave happened. We can all agree that was devastating. That was just insane. And it's just getting worse. So while Ria and I were in Egypt, we had the privilege of attending many of the World Health Organization events. And this was one of the presentations that we both enjoyed. It was talking about human health consequences from this changing climate. So we have, of course, shortages of water, food, dehydration, heat stroke, um, unemployment and homelessness. This is considered a human health issue because it impacts your mental health and your ability to access food. Mental health conditions that um, arose from this, it can be from experiencing the event firsthand, experiencing PTSD following, or anxiety about the future coming from climate change. This is generally consider considered a rational response. In uh, interpersonal aggression and violence has increased due to heat waves causing people to be more irritable. And in addition, we have inconsistent social services. So the next generation of kids, this is a big problem because heat waves or any sort of air pollution are causing major issues in infertility, premature deaths, as well, premature births, as well as low birth weight. So particles in the air from air pollution are being inhaled and 20% of newborn deaths um, are the cause of this. So infectious diseases, respiratory issues, allergic reactions, all are contributed to air pollution once again and population displacement that we talked about earlier being a major issue in your mental health. And I also just wanted to add, um, at COP27, I remember reading an article that was done, um, I believe, on Kenya regarding pregnant women. So they did a study and they, and they realized that the water that they were drinking had microplastic particles in it. And when the fetus was developing in the mothers, the plastic was... Um, getting intertwined with this developing child. And this was causing adverse effects. You can imagine cognitive underdevelopments, physiological underdevelopments, and already the air that we're breathing right now, imagine what's floating around that we're breathing in, plastic, pollutants, etc. And so I just really wanted to share that because that was really disheartening to hear. Um, along with human health, there's also um, the importance of protecting plants. And it's not just protect plants because let's protect plants. But if you didn't already know this, a lot of the plants that we have in this world are used for medicine. So worldwide, between 50,000 and 80,000 flowering plants are used medicinally. Of these, at least 15,000 may face extinction due to overharvesting and habitat loss. According to the National Cancer Institute, at least 70% of new drugs introduced in the United States in the last 25 years 
are derived from natural resources. And plant-derived anti-cancer drugs save at least 30,000 lives per year in the United States alone. So you can imagine how important it is to preserve these plants. Look at all the lives they're saving. Plant-derived anti-cancer drugs such as Taxol, first isolated from the Pacific U, save at least 30,000 lives per year in the United States. And also, what's really cool is, thanks to two drugs derived from alkaloids of Madagascar's rosy periwinkle, the likelihood of remission for a child suffering from leukemia increased by 85% between 1960 and 1997. And here is a quote from Endangered Species Act that I really thought that I wanted to share with you guys. What potential cures for cancer or other scourges, present or future, may lie locked up in the structures of plants which may yet be undiscovered, much less analyzed. Sheer self-interest impels us to be cautious. It's so important. There are so many plants that we haven't even discovered yet, we haven't even analyzed yet. Imagine the incredible health benefits they could, they could have. So it's so important to preserve these um, plants. And I also remember reading a statistic that 70% of pharmaceutical drugs that are behind the counter in the Western world are from plant origin. So you can already realize how important it is to protect plants. And here are plants and the drugs that they are in and what they help with. So, for example, there is the ginkgo biloba. And this helps with stimulation of peripheral. And um, you guys can just do some like research online and you quickly realize so many of the medications that I'm sure you guys even take are from plant origin and they help you, they help your health. And without them, we, oh man, you can, can't even imagine what will happen. So another component of COP27 is loss and damage. So what is loss and damage? Loss and damage is essentially a policy that supports developing vulnerable countries with loss and damage caused by climate change. In Glasgow, COP26, they demanded funding for loss and damage in developing countries. What's really cool though is this year at COP27, or I guess last year at COP27, within the first week of negotiations, developed countries were able to agree on $275 million that will go towards this funding. And, um, I think what also is really important for the Western world to realize is that America within itself contributes 33% of all global emissions. And in contrast, Africa as a whole continent only contributes 2.3% of global emissions. So the reason why loss and damage is so important is because Places like America are contributing so much to global emissions and they have the economic stability. They can, they can fund um, the damages, but other countries such as Kenya in Africa, they're getting the worst of it. They're contributing the least to it and they don't have the money to fund. So this is why this, this fund is so important to help with these damages. And what's really important too is that this policy also puts in place accountability. It is so important to make sure that these developed countries like Canada, like China, like um, America are accountable, that they're not just giving out money, but they're also working internally at combating climate change. And that's something that we were able to witness when we attended um, Joe Biden's speech. So that was a really incredible opportunity. So... COP27, let's talk about what actually happened while we were there. First, I just want to talk about COP21 in Paris in 2015. This was a major event because this was the first time a Paris Agreement, which is a legally binding international treaty, was put in place. The aim of the Paris Agreement is to limit the average global temperatures to increase less than 2 degrees Celsius, preferably 1.5 degrees Celsius, above pre-industrial levels, and achieve net zero emissions by 2050. This is important because we actually need this to happen to preserve a livable planet and to avoid the worst disasters from climate change. So what needs to happen for this to take place? We need greenhouse gas emissions to be reduced by 45% by 2030, and we need to reach net zero by 2050. 
for this to take place, we have to enhance adaptation to climate issues, and we also must align world financial flows with Paris Agreement aim. Net zero is cutting greenhouse gas emissions to as close to zero as possible, with any remaining emissions being reabsorbed um, from the atmosphere by carbon sinks. Carbon sinks are what we referenced earlier when we were talking about oceans taking toll. Carbon sinks include oceans, forests, and soil, and they are incredibly under threat, which is such a shame considering how necessary they are for our survival. With COP being the loss and damage COP, I wanted to bring up more on mitigation and adaptation. So as Rhea was explaining earlier, a summary of loss and damage, the negative impacts of climate change that occur despite or an absence of mitigation and adaptation. A quote from the United Nations about mitigation, the key for the solution to climate change rests in decreasing the amount of emissions released into the atmosphere and in reducing the current concentration of carbon dioxide by enhancing sinks. Adaptation involves adjusting policies and actions because of observed or expected changes in climate. This shows um, side by side what we're looking at when we talk about mitigation and adaptation. So mitigation, we're reducing emissions that cause it, and adaptation, we're managing what's taking place. Mitigation includes um, more clean energy for um, housing, as well as cleaner transportation and energy efficiency. Adaptation is talking about from the more business perspective, of um, infrastructure upgrades, flood protection, taking care of what's happening while we're dealing with it. A quote from an American scientist, we basically have three choices, mitigation, adaptation, and suffering. We're going to do some of each. The question is, what is the mix going to be? The more mitigation we do, the less adaptation will be required and the less suffering there will be. So this photo is from Rhea and I went to um, listen to Joe Biden's speech. So we're talking about at this year's COP creating a fund specifically for loss and damage. And what was very significant about COP27, COP it's the first time it was ever added to the official agenda and actually adopted, taken in place. So they agreed to start a transitional committee that's going to meet this March, talking about how to put these resources into use. Okay, it is critical to transition to clean energy as soon as possible. The good news is that the fastest type of energy, growing type of energy today is solar, with less developed countries in the lead. So what was kind of a nice perspective on this is from Per Espen Stoknes saying, climate change is a great opportunity to improve global collaboration and knowledge sharing and to create a more just society. All right, so this is kind of the fun part. So who did we meet and how are they helping? So we actually got the privilege of meeting Dr. Catherine Hayhoe. Um, she's a, C a chief scientist for the Nature C Conservancy and she is a global leading conservation organ, and that is a, sorry, that is a global leading conservation organization that works to protect ecologically important waters and lands for both nature and people. And she's the author of Saving Us, a climate scientist case for hope and healing for a d divided world. And she is Christian. What was amazing was in my physics class, we had the opportunity to choose any book to write a novel study on. Because I'm interested in climate change, I wrote it on um, Saving Us by Catherine Hayhoe, having no idea that in two weeks I was going to have dinner with her on the Red Sea. So that was so exciting. <laughs> So other memorable mentions is that we got to meet the Honorable Stephen Guibault and Princess of Morocco. So I'm going to just kind of share you guys the story of how we got to meet each of them. So with um, Stephen Guibault, um, it was really hot in Egypt and me and Sarah, we wanted ice cream. So we're at the conference center and we're walking around and we bump into this lady that we recognize from one of the um, negotiations that we were at where Stephen Guibault was present. And... We chit-chatted with her, exchanged um, business cards, and we were like, hey, by the way, do you know where the ice cream is? And she's like, yeah, right over there. So we went over there, and obviously we didn't listen and got lost, and we wandered into this zone, which I'm pretty sure was restricted, and somehow we got in. I don't know where the security was. Sarah doesn't know where the security was, but we got in, and it turned out 
that this zone was a place where all of the prime ministers, presidents, top leaders of nations were and we kind of wandered around we're like well we already kind of snuck into here let's see who we bump into so we get to the um the canada kind of room and we really lucked out and i think this was definitely god's graces at work here and we bumped into stephen gibeau who was returning from an interview and we were actually able to give Stephen Guibault a climate scarf, which you can see that he is wearing in figure 28. <laughs> and a climate scarf is a scarf that women in Australia, they knit, and it is actually scientific data of the average global temperature from 19, um, or sorry, 18, or tw- nine, 1918 to 2018. And what's really cool is CBC was there as well, and they took some pictures of us. So that was really cool. And we exchanged contact info. So that was fun. And um, another really fun story is when we got to meet the princess of Morocco. So this was, I think, a day or two after Stephen Gibo, And we had just arrived at the conference center and we were walking. And I remember looking to my right and seeing a bunch of people who looked very official. I assumed they had high status, but I was like, oh, well, I don't really know them. But let me click a few pictures just in case later I find out that they're someone really cool. So um, we're walking and it turns out we're walking the same direction. And then I was like, you know what? I have a really strong urge to crack a joke with this person. So I turned to her and I'm like, man, I wish it was in Canada because it is so hot here. And then she starts laughing and that was great. That was great. I didn't freak her out. And then um, a woman next to her, who I'm assuming was her secretary, she's like, oh, Canada, we actually have a biodiversity event there after COP27. And then I was like, oh, okay, because I didn't know what this was. So I gave her a thumbs up and I kind of just left. And I was like, that's so great. And um, and then I went towards Sarah and I was like, Sarah, like, I just talked to this woman. I don't know, but yay. And then um, a little bit later, we we started to see a bunch of people elevating towards her, running towards her, and crowds um, pooling together, and people screaming, Princess of Morocco! And that's when I realized, oh, she wasn't just a TikTok star or some random person, but she was actually a princess. So that was an incredible life experience. So the Princess of Morocco is really significant for climate change because she's the goodwill ambassador of the Congo Basin. And when we went and met her, she was going towards um, a French-speaking event where they were talking about saving the Congo Basin. So this is the world's second largest carbon sink next to the world's oceans. The quote, the lungs of Africa and the beating heart of the world is so true. And protection is so obviously needed. So it was so great that the princess herself came to talk on this issue. Okay, what can we do as individuals for climate change? So I don't know if any of you saw this TUSA video that came out when I was in my first year, but we talked about the six sustainable R's, which include refuse, reduce, repair, reuse, recycle, and rot or composting, basically in that order. So this video shown on the corner is a video of me talking about composting and how our, um, our school needs to do better. This is just a clip from the email I exchanged with Sodexo. They did weighing of their food for one week in a COVID year, so it actually had less people than usual, and they had 543.50 pounds of food wasted. That is significant considering how many more people we have this year, which means that's for sure increased. So the um, title of Catherine Hayhoe's talk, who we talked about earlier, she did a TED Talk in 2018, and it's titled, The Most Important Thing You Can Do to Fight Climate Change, talk about it. It's essentially what Rhea and I are doing right now. But what we can do as um, individuals in our communities is contact governments to take bold climate action. This can include transportation issues, um, bike lanes, or more accessible transportation that doesn't just come once every hour. We can talk about using energy wisely. Small changes add up, and the bonus is you save money from polluting less reducing transportation, consuming less, wasting less, and enjoying life more. Indigenous people are leaders in climate action, and that's because they have a close connection to environmental sustainability. And we, I think, are called to listen to them and what they have to say about climate action, as they have been studying this for years and know what they're talking about. 
when you see stuff online about um, indig indigenous-led climate action, listen to it because they often have something good to say that we wouldn't have thought of. Climate-friendly meals and voting, those are two important things. Politicians who aren't interested in climate action is something to be aware of if you're voting for them. And climate-friendly meals, uh, Rhea and I both uh, very much value this and we think that our small actions three times a day make a big difference. We talked about air pollution earlier and how big of an issue it is for human health all around the world. Some examples of policies that you can encourage policymakers to adopt include transportation. Um, this is urban transit, walking and cycling networks, interurban freight and um, passenger travel, as well as switching to cleaner diesel or low emissions vehicles, energy efficient homes, Power generation, which includes hydropower, solar, and wind, anything that's not emitting carbon. Power, um, better municipal waste management. This includes composting as well as recycling, reducing. One major thing, and the reason I said earlier when I mentioned the six R's as refusing being number one, is because it comes down to how much we're taking in and consuming on our own before we're even talking about recycling it. And something that I want to add is I actually recently read this study and if you guys are interested, feel free to come up to me and I will totally share it to you. But um, I read this study that said if all of America stopped eating red meat, that would cut down one third of all emissions. And so I thought that was really interesting. And if you guys want to know about that, let me know. So why should the youth care? Why should we care? And I just want to ask a question. Who in this audience is a grandparent? Just put your hand up. Yeah, pro probably not a lot of people, but better than no one. And who in this audience wants to be a grandparent one day? I know I do. I definitely want children. The reason why you as a youth should care about climate change is because this is directly impacting your future. So already in our lifespan, we can see what's going around, around in the world. We can see about the droughts, the floods, the fires, everything. And just imagine what's going to happen to our grandchildren, what's going to happen to our children. And so not only should we be fighting this for ourselves, but it is also to fight for our grandchildren. And personally, that's something that I worry about. I get anxious about that. I get sad about that because who knows what the future holds and... Um, it's really important that we try our best right now to reverse this, to slow this issue down, because who knows what our children, people that we love, are going to go through. And this is a quote that really stood out to me by Greta Thunberg. It says, I want you to feel as if our house is on fire, because it is. And if you look at the statistic data, our global average temperatures are just skyrocketing. And that is where we are heading. And that is the truth. And this also quote really stood out to me. So this is by a 10-year-old girl named Lily. And I just want to say her insight is incredible. And I really encourage you guys to educate yourselves and look into this topic of climate change so much because this young girl probably knows so much more than half of people our age know. But um, <laughs> she said... Let the children be what they want to be and not what you want them to be. Let them have this green heart and help the environment instead of you trying to control them to go back to not caring for the climate. So it's so important that we encourage the youth to fight for the environment, to preserve the environment. Because as we've talked about, not only does this affect just plants and animals, but it affects us, it affects human health, it affects mass migration, refugees. It, it is just a crisis in so many different areas and that is just saddening and so i think it's so important that we encourage that we encourage the youth and maybe you guys who are older it's like oh whatever that's okay but for us for me i care so much because i'm only 20 years old and this is just getting worse and i want to protect this planet for my kids so should followers of christ care Climate change is an issue of justice and loss of life. So these are a few Bible verses that really stood out to me and really confirmed my calling to protect the environment. Genesis 2.15 says, 
the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. It's so important to recognize here that God made man to take care of the garden. And this following verse is kind of eye-opening. It's from Jeremiah 2.7. And I brought you into a plentiful land to enjoy its fruits and its good things. But when you, ki- when you came in, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. So we were, we were created to protect this planet. And we were, we were created to enjoy the beauty, to preserve it. And what have we done? We've defiled it. We've thrown waste around the planet. If you go, when we went to the pyramids... Oh man, was there so much pollution? And that was that broke my heart because the pyramids are so beautiful. Everyone deserves to take in the beauty of them and seeing piles and piles of garbage. Every time I go to India, garbage absolutely everywhere. Am I even taking in India or am I just taking in like a dumpster, not like a dumpster place? But yeah, so it's just, it's so, so crazy. And this verse from Revelation 16, 8 to 9 says, The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and it was allowed to scorch people with fire. They were scorched by the fierce heat, and they cursed the name of God, who had power over these plagues. They did not repent and give him glory. It's so important to recognize our role in climate change, and it's so important to recognize that every single thing on this planet is a beautiful delicate, intricate creation of God. And if we truly love Christ with all of our heart, we will do whatever we can to protect his artwork because it is just so beautiful and we must give him glory and we must preserve his creations. Proverbs 16.8 says, Better a little with righteousness than much gain with injustice. And this is this for me kind of speaks into selfishness. It's so easy to just throw away whatever, not care about like, what are we doing? Buying a million clothes, shopping on Shein, fast fashion, whatever. We want to look good. But this life is depleting. It's going to end soon. And it's so important to recognize that our, our interactions, our decisions affect everyone around us. And it is so important to live in justice because the God that created us, Jesus who we love, is a God of justice. John 15, 12 to 13 says, My command is this, Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. And this really spoke to me because what we do, our ecological footprint is affecting all of us. What we do in Canada is affecting people in Africa. And it is so important to recognize this, that the second commandment that Jesus himself says is to love one another as I have loved you. And it is so important to do what we can to take action, to use our life, to use the power given by God's graces to make people, uh, or sorry, to protect people, to reduce our waste. We have to realize that plants, animals, life is at risk if we don't take charge We can live in denial and we can say whatever, blah, 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 but that's what Satan wants. But Christ, he wants us to recognize this problem. He wants action. And above anything else, he wants love. And 1 Timothy 6, 6 to 10 says, But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with it. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. I feel that what I have seen in my life regarding climate change and environmental issues is a lot of people stay blind. They deny, they turn away because so much of this has to do with money. Big companies, presidents, prime ministers, they don't care who's getting hurt. They don't care that people are starving. They don't care that there's droughts and that there's animals that are dying, that maybe my grandchildren will never, ever see a lion. And it's so important to realize that we are called to live minimalistic, simple lives, that we don't need to hoard in a bunch of stuff and buy a bunch of stuff and just reducing the things that you purchase and living this simple life is going to make such a positive impact for the planet. 
Thank you so much for listening to our presentation. We're opening it up for a Q&A if anyone has questions about our experience or a time in um, Egypt or COP27. Okay, so if you guys have questions um, about our experience, anything at all, just like raise your hand and this is the time where we will answer whatever you want to know. So, yeah. Oh, yes. What do you mean by minimalistic simple lives? So when I talk about this, um, I kind of look at my lifestyle and I kind of look at maybe my generation. I look at um, fast fashion and how there is such an urgent desire for everyone to wear the latest trends and look good and whatever else. And I know my closet has so many clothing that I don't need. And that is such a waste. So when I say simple, minimalistic lives, we don't need to hoard in so many things. We don't need a million shoes. We don't need to like, that's just like, why? And even when it comes to food waste, you know, why waste so much food? Why can't we just live simple lives? And um, that's what we are called to do anyways. Because when we pass away, we're not bringing any of this with us. Yeah, yeah so to bounce off of what you said earlier, I remember reading a stat that said, we wear 20% of our wardrobe 80% of the time. And so if you think about it, you know, do you really need to have like 50 t-shirts? Do you wear all 50 of them all the time? So what I did is like in my closet, I would just flip the hangers around. So like I just like make me you like yeah. actually do work. And like six months goes by and you're like, I really only wore 10 of the shirts. And then I just donated the rest of them. And I was like, well, I haven't missed them. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so important to realize that the reason why we're seeing specifically with clothing is you have to look at where are, the, where are these clothing manufactured? Look at the factories. Look at the pollution these factories are causing. And we already talked about climate refugees, health issues, air pollution, cardiovascular diseases, skyrocketing, allergies, etc. Children with cognitive and physiological underdevelopment. Everything is interconnected. And that is why climate change... <laughs> Awkward. But... But that is why it's so important that we take this issue seriously. Yeah. Nate? Um, so you guys were, were mentioning um, kind of what the outlook on renewables is in some uh, third or second world countries as well. So with it being very hard um, to rapidly uh, develop in like the United States compared to this, um, other smaller countries you were talking about, what would you say the, the source of the problem is for places like um, North America? Is it, it probably doesn't seem like it's a, it's a money issue if these countries are, are doing it better than us, but what would be kind of the solution so that we see better renewables in those places? Yeah, that's a great question. I actually would say it's a money issue because starting from clean energy to begin with is easier than transitioning a whole country to clean energy. So considering how we're all running on fossil fuels for everything we do, that transition is a much more difficult process than just starting from clean energy to begin with. But yeah, it's definitely something that um, when we're talking about loss and damage for countries that are underdeveloped, we also have to consider countries like um, Canada, like the US, who are contributing a lot more um, because obviously they're making their places have loss and damage, but we're also hurting ourselves in the long run too. So yeah, it's, it's us too. I actually want to share a personal story. So I remember on the flight when we were flying to Egypt, I had a lot of time to think because the flight is just, oh, so crazy. <laughs> but I remember turning to Sarah and sharing this really doubtful moment where I was like, Sarah, is climate change really even real? Why is it so urgent? Why are we on a plane right now missing so much school and going to Egypt? And all of these doubts flooded in my mind and I just became so hesitant what is God doing bringing me here on this crazy adventure? I'm not equipped to go on this. I don't even know if I fully believed in, in this issue. And when I look back now, I realize that's truly the moment where my COP27 experience began. Because at the end of our trip, I remember we went snorkeling on our very last day. And I've never been snorkeling. And um, I remember being in the Red Sea and I remember um, looking under the ocean and looking into the sea and just seeing just these vibrant, beautifully colored fish and the coral reef and just 
the vibrant blue sea. And in that moment, I really felt like my heart had intertwined with Jesus. And that's the moment where I realized this is why I'm here. This is why God brought me to COP27 because because his creations aren't just surface level. It isn't just here. And when I think about God, I think of someone who's up there. But in this moment, I was able to look underneath and I was able to realize that God's beautiful artwork, his creation is everywhere in the deepest depths and the highest places. And I was really able to recognize that I need to protect these animals. I need to protect these fish because they are so beautiful and everything serves a purpose in God's creation. Howard? What was your favorite moment from the whole trip? And I would like to hear from both. I'll actually start. My favorite moment wasn't at COP, but it was in Cairo where I went earlier. So I am half Egyptian and this is my first time in Egypt. And I was staying at my dad's friend's house and we just came back from an amazing day seeing the pyramids, Nile River, just everything I dreamed of my whole life. And I got to their condo and um, I didn't have Wi-Fi or anything to contact my family. And I overheard my dad's friend on the phone talking to my dad. So I asked him if he can pass me the phone. And I just like broke down crying because I was so emotional about the fact that This has been my dream my whole life to experience Egypt and see where my dad grew up and to think that I got to mix it with something I'm so passionate about is just such a great opportunity. Yeah, I have maybe like two little stories. I love stories. But um, so this was actually um, on our expedition to um, Egypt and we were in Turkey and I saw this man and for some reason I just had like a weird feeling that I'm going to talk to him. And so I turned to Sarah and I was like, I don't know what it is, but I have a feeling that on this huge aircraft, we're going to sit next to him. And by the way, me and Sarah, we didn't select our seats. So they were completely randomized. We didn't want to, yeah, we're college We didn't want to pay for that. So the fact that on this flight, me and Sarah were put next to each other, that in itself, probability wise, is extremely low. And then I had a really strong feeling sitting there because a third person who was sitting next to us hadn't arrived yet. And I was like, Sarah, I don't know what it is, but I think that guy that we saw earlier is going to sit next to us. I'm just, the Holy Spirit is telling me this. And so he comes and I'm like, oh, okay, great. I feel like I prophesied that. That's awesome. And he sits next to us and I have a strong urge to talk to him. And I see that he's listening to something and I'm like, oh, hey, like, what are you listening to? Like, I don't know, the new Drake album or something. And then he takes his ear earbud out and he's like, oh, I'm listening to the Quran. And it turned out that this moment was a moment where I was able to introduce Christ to this man. And that was so incredible. I had never experienced talking to someone who had never even considered Christianity and, and knew so little about it. So being able to talk to him in this aircraft and just it being a divine intervention moment was so beautiful and special to me. So that was definitely a really great um, moment. Another great moment was, um, I would say, interacting with Egyptian culture. So where our hotel was, there it was kind of like a strip of a bunch of like restaurants and stores and stuff. And there is this um, shawarma place that we went and ate every single day, every single meal. We would, everything was so cheap. We would see everything and we'd be like, oh my goodness, this looks so good, so good. And it's so cheap. So we were like, want to order all of it. (laughs) So we had mango smoothies every single meal, you can bet. And we slowly became to know everyone, all the employees, the little sweet shop, the ice cream place, the gelato place, the the McDonald's. And it came came to a point where me and Sarah felt like celebrities. We would just walk in and everyone would know, hey, it's those two girls from Canada here for COP27. And And just being like, yell our names and hand us free food on the street. It was like (laughs) crazy. People would come up to us and ask, like start speaking Arabic because they thought we're locals. Like, why does everyone know us? It was just crazy. It was just the best. Yeah. And I think um, with this, um, there were several people who called me very clever because I don't fall for those tourist bargaining tricks because I am Indian and my parents prepared me for this my whole life. And every time that they would try and upsell Sarah, I would come and listen and I'd be like, okay, they are totally scamming you. And I would tell them, hey, I'm not from Canada. I'm from India. I do this to tourists all the time. So you can't trick me. And we were able to um, kind of deviate from getting scammed a lot. So that was incredible. 
<laughs> Any other questions? David? Uh, I don't know if you and Sarah had research on this before or not, but would you consider that the war and other conflicts around the world also make the climate change worse? It does, but that's not something we really have control over, so that's why I didn't really include it, because I wanted to talk about policies that we can try to bring in to bring up to policymakers. But yeah, stuff like that, so ex extremely unfortunate, but yeah, I wanted to focus on what we could change, but yeah, I do agree that it does impact it. Um, so to clarify, are, is your question, how, do wars contribute to climate change? Oh yeah, definitely. Look at the mass production of ammunition, of equipment, things like that, traveling. It, oh, it definitely contributes. I'm not sure statistically, I haven't specifically looked into the um, topic, but yeah, I would say so. Yeah. So the, it seemed like you got hit by a lot of bad news, like you just hit us with a lot of bad news tonight. Um, what, like you talked about mental health, how did that affect you having a week of all this bad news about what's happening to our planet? Did it affect you mentally? To a certain extent, for a little bit, did. Um, I think I just looked back to Jesus and I looked at um, how there was so much sin and so much evil and there is so much hope in his resurrection. So I kind of was able to combat those psychological um, issues with looking at there is also that resurrectional hope with the environment. And there were moments where I was so excited to go to events and learn about things. And specifically, I'm very interested where at the, like the topic of where human health intersects with climate change. And there were some events that just didn't do it for me. And I was like, come on, like, this is the World Health Organization. Like, I'm sure me and Sarah could get up and like, have this incredible presentation. What's going on? And those moments were really disheartening. And I know I got really overwhelmed. I would say there were people on the trip who came with us and they just, they would leave early because they couldn't handle it because it is so devastating. The things that you hear and you see people first handedly experiencing. We're lucky. We don't really see that as much. But um, I think what gave me hope as well is realizing that these people aren't maybe um, educating or as passionate as I hope they would be. But that gave me, um, I would say, courage to see that I can be that person one day. You know, I can, I can one day be at the World Health Organization and I can put on an incredible presentation and I can reach thousands of people. And so that gave me a lot of hope. And um, yeah, that made me really optimistic and just kind of realizing that maybe this is why God brought us here to see this. And we have so much influence as well. So Rhea and I are actually in a documentary coming up that we filmed in Egypt. And the main character, her name's Elsa. And we talked to her and just asked, she is pretty well known in the climate activism community. So she was asked to do this documentary and we were just like side characters. But um, I asked her, or Rhea asked her, like, how are you feeling about climate activism after coming to COP all these years? And she just was saying she's so discouraged. There was no enthusiasm. She's just discouraged. And Rhea and I talked about it after feeling like, why would you come all this way if you feel like there's no hope? And it, I would say it was disheartening for me because um, I remember from Kat's presentation last year, she talked about Paris Agreement. So I knew what Paris Agreement was going into it. And then we heard about what, because this has now been 2015. This has been over five years since that's happened, right? What have countries actually done to follow through on what they said they were going to do? And it, way less than they promised, way less. And so I was very sad about that because as two 20 year olds, what are we going to do if the government refuses to do anything about it? So it was sad, I think, to see the reality and be in the room with the politicians basically admitting that they didn't get to what they promised they'd do. But I'm excited and hopeful for the future because we, among thousands of people, are passionate about a change like this happening for all of us. And we as individuals do make up what, make, what changes do occur. So I am excited and I am hopeful for what's coming next, considering how many people are willing to spend their lives focusing on it. Yeah, and it's so, and like everyone can say like, oh yeah, like the president came to Biden, but like they don't really care. They probably flew in on their private jets, which is true. Um, I saw that and I have pictures of that. Um, yeah, it's pretty crazy. 
Which is true. And then people can argue. So what's even the point of this? If these people in power aren't even going to do anything, this is the best that we can get so far. This is the world's largest climate crisis con- conference. If we just take it from that perspective and just give up and think, oh, well, like the people who make the decisions can't do anything, then what's even the point? Why are we even here? But if you can recognize that you have so much power and you have purpose in your life, you can be that one day and you can influence people's decisions. You can take action. And that is so valuable to recognize that action can be done even if, I don't know, Biden doesn't really care and he just wants to throw money everywhere. Yes. Um, in, the, in your opinion, what do you think is holding all these leaders back? Money. <laughs> it will cost trillions for all these plans to go to place. Yeah, and I don't know, very bluntly, when it, when it comes to people like this, I feel like from my personal perspective, they only care about money and they're not going to be alive when this gets worse. We are going to be alive when this gets worse. So why do they, they shouldn't, they probably don't care as much because of that. The reason why me and Sarah care so much about this is because we're young. We're going to live through this and who knows what's going to take us. And so, yeah, it's definitely money and um, it's politicians trying to please everyone, which is impossible. There are so many people and I'm sure people in this room who don't even know if they believe in climate change or are, I don't know, ambiguous about the idea. And I know I was, but it's just so important to recognize that there is so much hope. And I feel like the answer to everything is always love and education. I just wanted to know, was T1.5 alive a chance in the last one? It was not. It was not? I know, it was not a chance. Um, in Egypt, it, they did. Oh, it, it, I saw. Oh, you saw one? Oh, yeah. Okay, so fun little story. Um, um, Sarah got into Joe Biden's speech right away. I didn't because I just like, I don't know, I was like talking and I got distracted. So I didn't like sign up right away. But then I had to go very early and get into line. And then I saw there's a like, huge rally where everyone was like saying, keep 1.5 alive, which by the way, if you look at statistical data is impossible. And that is great. Oh. That's not possible. <laughs> Keeping 1.5 alive? It's all That's so cool. It's almost impossible, impossible but it's impossible. Possible. It's it's not going to (laughs) happen. But um, yeah, so we did see that. And yeah. But yeah, I want to say like in Egypt, it wasn't as free to do kind of like political runs like that in Glasgow. So it was definitely a lot more toned down and you kind of just stay to your zones. Carissa. Do you think part of the issues with like creating real change is the fact that um, in certain government systems, there's only someone in power for X amount of time? And regardless of what their opinions are, if someone else comes in and has a different opinion, they can kind of undo everything that was just previously done. Absolutely. Because actually, even when Joe Biden first came in, he put their put U.S. back into the Paris Agreement. So that's an example of just when someone comes in, you can make a change. So yeah, everything can feel short term for politicians. That's a huge factor. I feel like also age comes into role. Most politicians are older and they lack the education on climate change. Um, we're really lucky that we get to learn about it. I truly believe that it should be instilled in our education systems a lot more. I think it should be a mandatory co- like course. But I think that people in power are just too old and they don't really know about this and they probably don't care. And it's definitely that as well. When um, political power switch, it can deviate from the process of what they were committed to regarding climate change. Yes. Hi, uh, I'm a climate scientist, so I can comment on the last bit that Mm. you mentioned. So carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere for a long time. Methane gets removed faster. The problem is that even if you stopped emitting carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the one that's there would be there for hundreds of years. Mm. So you will pass 1.5. There's no question about it. I'm not pessimistic, I'm optimistic, but I'm realist too. Agreed. So forget the 1.5, we're not going to make that, mm. unfortunately. But we cannot stop and sit and say, okay, everything is lost, forget about it. You can't do that. Because as you said, I might be gone, but you guys will be there, your children will be there, you can't let them suffer. Exactly, exactly. And um, for me, it was really important that we conclude this event with prayer. So if you guys are comfortable, you can join us. And I would love to pray for all of us. Dear Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you so much for 
bringing each individual here tonight to be able to learn about this topic that I know is near and dear to your heart. Father, I pray that you are able to open their eyes and realize how much of a serious issue this is, how this impacts so many different areas of life, animals, plants, human health. And Father, I just pray that each individual here tonight, that their heart is touched in some way through this event. And I pray that they are able to go and do their own research and educate themselves and realize that this is going to directly impact their future and their lives. And I pray, Father, that you give them comfort and love because there is so much hope in Jesus Christ and there is so much hope in resurrection. And Father, I just yeah, I just want to really thank you for this special moment, for bringing me and Sarah to Egypt and for solidifying our passion for climate change. And I pray that each individual in this room, that they are um, open to climate change and that they also are passionate and that they also um, feel motivated about this. And I pray that they also take action and that they go home and they talk about this with their friends and families. And um, I just pray that you lead them through this journey. And I just thank you so much in your beautiful creations and your love and for bringing us here. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>